Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first webinar of the year and also the first webinar from the new educational initiative, which was put together in the joint effort by the European Society of Pediatric Nephrology, International Pediatric Nephrology Association, and the European Reference Kidney Network. My name is Elena Levchenko. I'm a pediatric nephrologist from Leuven, Belgium, and I will moderate this webinar out of my office in Leuven. In this new series of webinars, we will provide educational lectures, which will cover a full spectrum of topics in pediatric nephrology and rare kidney diseases over a period of three years. Uh, these lectures represent a core curriculum to prepare to, for the board examination in pediatric nephrology and for the certification in rare kidney diseases, the two types of examinations which we are planning to organize in the future by ESPN and ERCnet. Next to these educational webinars, IPNA started with webinars on the best clinical practice in pediatric nephrology, and the first webinar will be broadcasted on this Thursday. The advanced ERCnet webinars uh, which are already uh, organized for two years on rare kidney diseases will continue once per month on Tuesdays. So please follow the announcements and register yourself for these webinars. We really hope you will enjoy them and learn a lot. For those of you who cannot, or your colleagues who cannot attend uh, these uh, live webinars, there is a possibility to see the recorded lecture on the website of ERCnet and probably later on on the website of the ESPN and IPNA. So let's move to the topic and the lecture of today, uh, which will be um, the embryology of uh, the kidney and urinary tract and will be presented by Jacqueline Orr from Pittsburgh. Jacqueline Orr, uh, PhD uh, and Master of Science is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Nephrology at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She earned her medical degree in the University of Western Ontario, Canada, and trained in pediatrics in British Columbia Children's Hospital, University of British Columbia in Canada. And subsequently, she was trained in pediatric nephrology at Children's Hospital Boston Harvard Medical School. So their leading course of chronic kidney diseases and uh, renal failure in children, as you all know, uh, is uh, most frequently abnormal development of the kidney and urinary tract. And um, so uh, the research program of Dr. Orr is really focused on understanding the role of microRNAs in uh, kidney development and disease. Her laboratory has recently shown that microRNAs are involved in regulating the proliferation and survival of nephron progenitors in the developing kidney, which is a very new and exciting topic. And this can have important implications for congenital nephron endowment and subsequent kidney health in children and adults. So uh, Dr. Ho is really the expert on the topic. And actually, you will mention that um, their uh, lectures uh, of this new series of webinars will come uh, from around the globe and not as we had uh, heard uh, previously uh, from Europe only. So this is really very, very exciting. So that during the webinar, um, you will be able to send your questions. So you don't have to wait until the end of the webinar to send your questions. You can use the panel, which you all see on your screen. And uh, at the end of the lecture, I will read your questions and uh, Dr. Orr will answer them. You will also have poll questions to you. So please be active and you will have an opportunity uh, to actively participate in the webinars. I think uh, now, uh, Jackie, uh, the floor is yours, uh, and we are really looking forward to uh, to hear your lecture, please. Well, thank you so much for uh, that great introduction. I'm very excited to sort of lead off this series of webinars and hope that um, this educational webinar series will be uh, helpful to our community as a whole. So I was asked to, uh, to talk about embryology of the kidney and lower urinary tract. And so what I thought the objectives of my talk today would be to first kind of 
put this in the context of understanding the significance of congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract in pediatric kidney disease. And then we'll talk about the embryological origins of the kidney and how that impacts nephron number and nephron pattern. Um, and then uh, for the latter part of the talk, discuss the development of the lower urinary tract and how that impacts kidney function. So just to start off, I think this is not a surprise to this audience. Um, congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract are the most common cause of renal failure in children. This is uh, data that was taken from uh, NAPROTEX, the North American Pediatric uh, Renal Transplant uh, Cooperative Registry, um, but it is consistent, I think, around the world insofar as um, a significant portion of children who require a kidney transplant do so because of uh, renal aplasia, dysplasia, or hypoplasia. Um, and due to obstructive uropathy, which in at least this cohort um, comprises about 30% of children who require a kidney transplant. When I think about kidney development, I think about um, two, I think, broad categories. One, sort of how kidney development gives rise to an appropriate number of nephrons during kidney development. And then secondly, how it gives rise to uh, nephrons that are of appropriate pattern. So interestingly enough, um, human kidneys contain a wide variation in the number of nephrons that are formed during kidney development. And some autopsy studies have estimated that this range is anywhere from about 200,000 to 2 million nephrons when you're born in humans. And then as you can see on the panel on the right, each nephron really has to acquire a really complicated three-dimensional structure, which is um, important for its function in acid-base uh, maintenance, uh, water homeostasis, and salt balance. And you can see that that three-dimensional structure also has a pretty complicated interaction with the blood vessels around it, both in the glomerular capillaries and the peritubular capillary network. So all of that together kind of is important for normal uh, kidney function. So when I think about abnormalities in kidney development, I think about them broadly in the context of a decrease in nephron number or hypoplasia or abnormal nephron formation or uh, dysplasia. And then when we broadly think about um, the lower urinary tract, we know that anomalies in the lower urinary tract, depending on when they happen, can result in significant impacts on kidney development, both renal hypoplasia or dysplasia. And that postnatally urological issues um, have a significant impact on renal outcomes. So depending on the type of lower urinary tract anomaly you have, you're often at risk for um, an increased risk for urinary tract infections, nephrolithiasis, um, or have uh, hydronephrosis. So with that background, I wanted to move towards sort of the embryologic origin of the kidney and lower urinary tract. And so the three of the three germ layers in the embryo, the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, most of the kidney and lower urinary tract is gonna come from the uh, intermediate mesoderm. So this is a, a schematic diagram of a mouse embryo shown here on the left. And on the right is a, um, a transverse section that shows you sort of different portions of the mesoderm here. This on the uh, body walls, the side of the body wall is termed the lateral plate mesoderm. Um, next to the neural tube is the somitic mesoderm. It's between the somitic mesoderm and the lateral plate mesoderm in which the intermediate mesoderm resides. And so the intermediate mesoderm is what gives rise to the different components of the developing nephron. There are actually sort of three kidney-like um, structures that develop during kidney development the pronephros, mesonephros, and then the mature um, kidney or definitive mammalian kidney, the metanephros. The pronephros starts and is derived from the intermediate mesoderm. It grows, actually starts from the cranial end or nearest the head and grows caudally. It's thought to be largely non-functional during kidney development. It is functional in um, fish and, and other lower organisms, but not functional in mammalian systems. The mesoderm is the second sort of um, embryological kidney that is derived. The mesonephric um, uh, nephrons are actually induced by the nephric duct shown here. It's thought that this has no or minimal function, and the mesonephros itself 
mostly um, degenerates during kidney development, like the pronephros, apart from a portion of the mesonephros that will become the vas deferens in males, um, the mesonephros uh, pretty much completely regresses in females. And then on the far right diagram shown here is the um, information regarding the uh, development of the definitive mammalian kidney. <laughs> And that begins about embryonic day 10.5 in the mouse and about the fifth week of gestation in humans, shown here. And I'm going to uh, talk about really the development of the metanephros in more detail um, because that's what gives rise to the definitive mammalian kidney. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, uh, the metanephric kidney develops and starts about the fifth week of gestation in humans and embryonic day 10.5 in mice. Um, it, arises really from two main embryological lineages, um, the ureteric bud and the metanephric mesenchyme. The ureteric bud buds off from the mesonephric duct, which is also called the Wolfian duct or the pro, um, shown here. And it buds off from a caudal most aspect of the mesonephric duct around E10.5 or the fifth week of gestation. It contacts a, a cluster of mesenchymal cells shown here, um, which sort of uh, condense around the tip of the ureteric bud to form the metanephric mesenchyme. And in the next couple of slides, I'll go into a little bit more detail how um, the individual nephrons are induced um, during kidney development. The rest of the images on this slide kind of show you a little bit about how the kidneys migrate during kidney development. So the initial induction of the metanephric kidney occurs pretty close to the um, caudal end of the embryo around where the limb buds first appear but throughout development as you go through a b c and d you can see that the kidney ascends the kidney also rotates and abnormalities in how those kidneys ascend or rotate result in a number of different types of congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract So this is kind of a bit of a closer look about what's happening with those two um, uh, lineages that give rise to the the definitive kidney. Um, the the metanephric mesenchyme, which comes from the intermediate mesoderm, condenses around the tip of the ureteric bud. It's known that these two tissues are very important in um, conveying signaling molecules to each other during kidney development to induce the formation of nephrons. So the ureteric bud responds to signals from the metanephric mesenchyme, um, such as uh, GDNF or glial derived neurotrophic factor. And in response to those signals, the ureteric bud starts to branch and continues to branch in an iterative fashion throughout kidney development. And the ureteric bud effectively forms the collecting system of the kidney and also gives rise to um, the ureter. Similarly, in response to signals from the ureteric bud, the metanephric mesenchyme will condense into a cap of uh, nephron progenitor cells around the tip of the ureteric bud. You'll hear this referred as, to as metanephric mesenchyme, cat mesenchyme, or nephron progenitors, but in effect, this is a cluster of cells that have to exist throughout kidney development to form nephrons. And they're thought to be a progenitor-like population because they have to proliferate throughout kidney development, so they get an appropriate number of nephrons at the end of kidney development. They also are multipotent, so they differentiate into all of the cell types of the nephron, including podocytes, proximal tubule, loop of Henle, and distal tubule. And they do so through a series of events so that the mesenchyme of this progenitor population undergoes a mesenchymal to epithelial transition to form early epithelial derived um, developing nephron structures. So they go through various stages, including the renal vesicle, comma-shaped body, S-shaped body, shown here, and then finally into the definitive nephron. And so just to kind of review what the lineages of the different nephron segments look like, the ureteric bud shown on the right panel here in red, um, really um, throughout kidney development gives rise to the collecting duct and ultimately portions of the ureter. Uh, the nephron uh, progenitor population will give rise to podocytes, um, here proximal tubule, loop of Henle, and then distal tubule. Uh, so we talked mostly about the ureteric bud and uh, nephron progenitor population because those are sort of the two I think best described uh, renal lineages but clearly there are other cell types within the kidney including 
the renal stroma, which forms a niche around um, both the ureteric bud and the nephron progenitor population, and endothelial cells that um, grow into the developing glomerulus shown here and um, become specialized glomerular endothelial cells or fenestrated endothelial cells and then peritubular uh, endothelial cells. It's thought that the endothelial cells kind of from the kidney arise a portion of them from within the kidney through a process called vasculogenesis and a portion of them um, through branching of other blood vessels into the kidney called angiogenesis. So I think this leads us to our first question. So you're seeing an infant with renal dysplasia in the clinic. Which of the following stages of renal development is correct? And then please select one of the following. The proximal tubule arises from the metanephric mesenchyme. Uh, the mesonephros forms part of the mature kidney. The metanephros begins to form in the second trimester. The pronephros functions during early embryogenesis and the ureteric bud gives rise to proximal and distal nephron segments. Cool. And so the, the answer that was 70% of the attendees had uh, responded to was is correct. So the proximal tubule does arise from the metanephric mesenchyme. Um, the mesonephros uh, degenerates and apart from forming part of the vas deferens in males is not part of the, it's actually, sorry, is not part of the mature kidney at all. And in general, is does not exist in the, um, in the newborn infant apart from forming part of the uh, vas deferens. The metanephros begins to form in the first trimester, and then the pronephros is thought to, to not function, and the ureteric bud should really just give rise to, to the collecting system. Excellent. All right. So we talked sort of broadly about the processes of kidney development. I think um, in the beginning of the introduction, I talked about if you have abnormal kidney development, one of the things one might see would be uh, abnormal form abnormalities in how many nephrons are formed. So in humans, all the nephrons are formed by about 36 weeks of gestation. So that's your entire nephron complement. Um, and it's generally thought then that if you have fewer nephrons that form, that you're more at risk for the development of chronic kidney disease and hypertension um, as an adult or as a young child. So how is it that we think that the number of nephrons are formed? So there are probably a number of contributing factors, and I thought we'd discuss a little bit about what the, the developmental factors would be, and then how those could be impacted by genetic or environmental factors. And so one of the uh, features that we know is that the number of progenitors or the amount of the cat mesenchyme that occurs is important uh, in how many nephrons that are formed. And so this was actually a study that was done by a Frank Constantini's group in New York City. And what they did in the mouse was they asked the question, what would happen if you had fewer progenitors or fewer of that cat mesenchyme in the number of nephrons that you formed? And so the top panel here um, shows you the, the black is the branching ureteric bud and the little blue circles are um, caps of nephron progenitors around the tips of each of those ureteric buds. And you can see that in the normal kidney or wild type kidney that gives rise to a certain complement of nephrons. When you use a, a genetic, um, a tr conditional transgenic model to ablate some of those uh, progenitor cells and reduce the size of the cap around each ureteric tip, um, they have fewer branching events from the uh, ureteric tips, and then you develop a smaller kidney with fewer nephrons. So it's thought that the number of progenitors by itself that you make during kidney development has an impact on the number of nephrons you form. Similarly, how well your ureteric tree branches, um, because at the tip of each ureteric tree, uh, at the tip of each ureteric 
um, tree is where the new nephrons are induced. Um, so the better you branch, the more nephrons that you're likely to form. And sort of overlaid on this process is their niche, which is the renal stroma. So there are signals from the mesenchyme that surround the progenitors and the urocaric tips that help govern how well they branch and how well those progenitors proliferate. So it's thought that those are all processes that kind of impact how many nephrons you form before you're born. And we know that, that this proce these processes are impacted by a number of genetic and environmental factors. And so um, there are, have been a number of syndromes that are associated with poor formation of the of uh, nephrons. And there are a number of environmental factors that are thought to contribute to this. So um, vitamin A and retinoic acid signaling is thought to be really important in the number of nephrons that you make. And so if you have vitamin A deficiency, that's one reason why one has the formation of fewer nephrons. Also true sort of, um, and has been described in some mouse models of uh, nutritional deficiencies um, and uh, uh, hypoxia. So what is it, the, the second piece that we talked about for kidney development that impacts how well your kidneys function postnatally is the pattern um, that develops. And so what is it that determines that pattern? So there's more and more information coming out about um, both the signaling factors, transcription factors, and um, other um, components that contribute to nephron pattern. And so this is taken from a review from Greg Dressler that kind of outlines the different uh, parts of nephron patterning and shows you some of the genes that are kind of critical in that process. So in panel A here in purple is the ureteric bud and then clustered around it in the um, sort of fluorescent green is the cat mesenchyme or metanephric mesenchyme and then the sort of teal color is the cluster of renal stroma. And so those were the um, lineages that we were talking about in the previous slide that helped dictate how many nephrons that you form. Some of the signaling factors um, that kind of contribute to how well this ureteric bud branches is the, so this mesenchyme expresses GDNF and um, binds to the RET receptor in the ureteric bud. And those, that event is really critical for your ureteric branching. We know that these transcription factors 6, 2, and cited 1 are really important in the specification of this progenitor population. And then as we move through the different um, uh, differentiation steps, these progenitors undergo that mesenchymal to epithelial transition to form a renal vesicle here. And then these progressively become more differentiate forming comma, S-shaped bodies, and then a sort of more definitive nephron. You can see in panel C sort of um, these red cells are the um, glomerular endothelial cells that are being recruited into the cleft of the S-shaped body that will subsequently form the um, fenestrated endothelium in the glomerulus. And you can see that there are a number of endothelial um, receptor ties and kinases that are important um, in those endothelial cells. Some of the signaling pathways that we think are important in patterning the nephron include sort of wind signaling shown here, um, notch signaling. And then you can see in panel D that some of the transcription factors that are um, in the expressed in the podocytes include WT1, which is um, mutated in Dennis Strash syndrome, for example. So that is just to kind of give you a sense of some of the genes and signaling pathways involved in deterring nephron number, or sorry, nephron pattern. And so what are the implications? <clears throat> because congenital nephron endowment really varies widely amongst different individuals, um, it's led to kind of this idea called renal reserve with the thought that through life, that you have progressive loss of nephrons due to aging, um, other types of kidney disease or injury, hypertension, and that if you're born with a decreased reserve initially, that this leads to an increased risk for chronic kidney disease. And I think that will lead us to the second question. <clears throat> so you are, you are seeing a prenatal consult about an 18-week gestational age ultrasound demonstrating a small echogenic kidney. Which of the following is true? Renal dysplasia at this stage has no effect on renal outcome. New nephrons can be made postnatally to compensate. The child is likely to develop chronic kidney disease. The child will have renal failure as an infant. Uh, pulmonary hypoplasia is not a predictor of renal function.
Cool. So 76% said the child is likely to develop chronic kidney disease, and that is the most accurate statements there. <clears throat> so renal dysplasia at this stage is likely to affect renal outcomes. So you would imagine that um, kidney development get, begins about the fifth week of gestation through to the 36th week of gestation. So if you're seeing abnormalities in kidney development by 18 weeks, that's likely to affect the number of nephrons that you form and how well they are formed. Um, so new nephrons can't be made postnatally to compensate. So once you make your complement of nephrons by 36 weeks gestation, you really can't make any more postnatally. There is recovery from acute kidney injury that occurs postnatally, but that is thought really to be more um, in the context of repair of your existing nephrons rather than making new nephrons. Um, the child will have renal failure as an infant. So it, that is a potential possibility for this child. I haven't really given, I think, enough information for us to say for sure that that is the case. Um, the, the, the likelihood is that the, what I've given you is enough information to say that they're likely to develop chronic kidney disease and that there's a significant variability in the course that the infant might have postnatally. So it's just not clear that this would be sufficient to, um, to predict that the child would have renal failure. And then finally, uh, pulmonary hypoplasia, hypoplasia is a significant predictor of renal function because it's a reflection of oligohydramnios. And in the setting of oligohydramnios, you would be more concerned about sort of the embryological kidney function than otherwise. So I'm going to uh, move on to talk a little bit about lower urinary tract development and just to put this sort of part of the talk in context, up to 35% of children with renal failure have associated lower urinary tract disease. And so, um, although I've kind of split them into kidney development and lower urinary tract development, clinically, that's not a, a division that necessarily makes a lot of sense because a lot of the children have overlapping features. Um, and then lower urinary tract disease, you can think of as uh, uh, events that result in structural obstruction. So posture urethral valves, uh, bilateral ureteral uh, pelvic junction obstruction, bilateral ureteral vesicle junction obstruction, or you could imagine a functional obstruction in the setting of non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder or uh, reflux nephropathy. So we're going to talk in the lower urinary tract development a little bit about the ureter and the bladder. And so just to kind of broadly give you a sense of where the um, lineages in the ureter and the bladder are derived from. The ureter um, has sort of two main components, the urethelial layer and then a mesenchymal layer that comprises the muscle and lamina propria. Oops. So the urethelium is formed from the distal ureteric bud, um, which is derived from the intermediate mesoderm. And then the muscle and lamina propria of the ureter comes from the periwolfian duct stroma. So that's the mesenchymal tissue that sort of surrounds the wolfian duct, also called the mesonephros. And it's thought, um, at least by some folks, that this comes from the tail bud mesenchyme. And that these processes, um, the multi-layer differentiation of the urethelium um, and having multiple layers of, uh, of mesenchymal structures like the muscle and lamina appropria sort of are finishing up around the 10th week of gestation because that's the beginning of urine production and so it has to be convey urine at that point. This uh, histological picture is actually from a mouse postnatal day one that was kindly provided by my uh, colleague Dr. Bates and this shows you um, sort of the structure of a ureter so you can see the U marks here the urothelial layer of the ureter and then the um, mesenchymal a muscle layer, and then there's sort of a um, lamin appropriate in the middle here, which is a little bit thinner. The bladder is, in contrast to other components of the lower urinary tract, actually has an endodermal component. And so the urethelium from the bladder is formed from the urogenital sinus, which is endodermal in origin. And then the muscle and lamin appropriate from the bladder also come from that periwolfian duct stroma. And it's thought that the bladder starts to develop around the 12th week of gestation. And so on the right-hand panel here, again, this is from a postnatal day one mouse. It shows you the urethelial layer of the bladder here, the lamina propria, which is sort of this lacier appearance of mesenchyme here, and then the um, muscle layer here, 
which is typically in sort of three layers that are different orientations. So let's sort of walk back a little bit and talk a little bit about how the ureter um, develops. And so this is a schematic diagram that was kindly provided by Melissa Anzo, who's a trainee in my group. And so this here is the cloaca and then the a Wolfian duct here. Around E10 and E11 and a half, the ureteric bud grows out from the caudal aspect of the Wolfian duct here. Um, and this is sort of meant to denote the peri-Wolfian duct stroma. This portion of the um, of the Wolfian duct between the cloaca and the ureteric bud is also called the common nephric duct. There is a number of uh, signaling events that occur between the peri-Wolfian duct stroma here and the ureteric bud, which is really important in kind of determining where the ureteric bud comes off of the Wolfian duct. As you move from E11.5 to E14, so this is sorry, in mouse, um, the common nephric duct actually shortens and then it um, rotates and integrates into the urogenital sinus, which is going to be near the, and the ha this happens near the future bladder neck. So in this image, you can see that the ureter is actually here and the Wolfian duct has moved down here. And there's no longer that common nephric duct. This signaling from the peri-Wolfian duct stroma is thought to really determine the position uh, by which, where the ureter inserts into the bladder. And this is important because this is thought to be uh, a, a contributing factor for how one can develop either obstruction or vesicourethral reflux. Um, so this slide kind of describes a hypothesis called the Mackey Stevens hypothesis, which talks about where um, the ureteral insertion into the bladder happens depending on um, whether or not it results in sort of the ureter inserting too low or too high. And so in the set in the normal setting in B, this would be the normal um, place where the ureteric bud buds off and it contacts the metanephric mesenchyme and forms a normal um, kidney ureter uh, insertion into the bladder. When the ureteric bud buds off too high or cranially, shown here in C, then the ureter in, tends to insert too low and this is thought to result more in more obstruction. In contrast, if the ureteric bud is positioned too low here in A, then it inserts high in the bladder and is thought to be associated with um, vesicoureteral reflux. Um, this um, schematic diagram kind of gives you a sense of some other kind of components to ureteral development. And so we talked a little bit about where the ureteric bud branches off from the Wolfian duct. This kind of image was meant to kind of discuss what happens in terms of the differentiation of ureteral smooth muscle and how ureteral peristaltic waves begin. And so the ureteral smooth muscle typically um, occurs in the direction of the bladder here towards the kidney. And so you'll see that the muscular layers to the uh, ureteral muscle wall and laminal propria will become more differentiated near the bladder in that this will progressively move upwards towards the kidney. Interestingly, the, it goes kind of in an opposite fashion for the development of the ureteral peristaltic wave. So the ureter does have peristaltic waves and it happens actually from the peristaltic waves themselves happen starting from the renal pelvis moving downwards, as you might expect to kind of move, promote urine flow towards the bladder. But they're thought to arise from pacemaker cells that um, uh, exist actually in the renal pelvis and that develop in the renal pelvis and then move the urine this way. Uh, this image on the right just kind of gives you a sense of the urethelial layer here, which is derived from the ureteric bud, and then the smooth muscle cells and adventitial fibroblasts that are derived from the peri-Wolfian duct stroma. So this is a, um, a cross-section of the ureter shown here. On the left, these panels A and B just give you a sense of what happens with the um, common nephric duct. So you can see here in A that this is the budding of the ureteric bud out into the metanephric mesenchyme inducing the formation of the mature kidney and that over time the kidney is going to grow and rotate, but that this common nephric duct ultimately is going to shorten. So it's shorter here than here. And it comes, um, it's thought to 
at least partly be related to apoptosis of the carboniferic duct. So I'm going to um, finish by talking a little bit about bladder and urethral development. And so these images are taken, sort of this schematic is um, from sagittal views of a developing embryo. Um, in panel A, what we're showing here is the cloaca here. The urorectal septum, which is this gray part here, is going to partition this cloaca into a ventral urogenital sinus here and then a dorsal rectum. And you can see it grows down in partitions here so that this becomes the urogenital sinus and that the, this becomes the dorsal rectum. This urogenital sinus here, um, the anterior part of this has begun, this anterior part here is going to become the bladder. And then the posterior part of the urogenital sinus becomes the pelvic urethra in males and becomes the entire length of the urethra in females. The bladder is also connected um, to the umbilical cord via the allantois shown here. Around the fifth week of gestation, this allantois um, regresses and becomes the urachus and then ultimately the, the medial uh, umbilical ligament. And so I think this is going to bring us to question three. Which of the following is the most accurate statement about prenatal obstruction? Prenatal obstruction does not affect nephron pattern. Prenatal obstruction does not affect nephron number. The effect of obstruction happens in the third trimester. Tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis predict outcome. The outcome is dependent on genetic mutations. So 61% uh, said tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis predict outcome, which is true. Um, so we think prenatal obstruction affects both nephron pattern and nephron number, um, and so it can give you and contribute to renal hypoplasia and renal dysplasia. Um, <clears throat> the effect of obstruction happens in the third trimester. It can happen sort of throughout, but um, is probably, in fact, most deleterious earlier during kidney development. And um, the outcome is dependent on genetic mutations. That's probably not the most accurate, um, but is true in some genetic mutations. So I just wanted to kind of summarize what we talked about today. Um, first, we talked about the developing mammalian kidney being largely derived from two cell lineages that arise from the intermediate mesenderm, the metanephric mesenchyme, and the ureteric bud and that the biological processes involved in kidney development establish a normal nephron number, a normal nephron pattern prior to birth in humans, and that we think when this goes awry, that this increases the development for kidney disease, and that this is probably proportional to the number of functioning nephrons you form during kidney development. Um, we talked about the lower urinary tract, which is also largely derived from the intermediate mesoderm, apart from a component of the bladder, which comes from the endoderm. And that aberrant lower urinary tract development is often associated with abnormal kidney development. And so these are often uh, linked in time. And so when I think about congenital urogenital anomalies, I think about them in sort of broad categories of abnormalities in the development of the renal parenchyma, which results in renal hypoplasia or dysplasia. Um, we talked a little bit about migration of the kidneys. And so at abnormal migration of the kidneys can result in ectopic kidneys or kidneys that are in places that are um, 
um, not expected, most commonly like a pelvic kidney. Um, fusion anomalies in which the kidneys as they migrate um, fuse across the midline like in a horseshoe kidney. And then abnormalities in the developing urinary <clears throat> collecting system that can result in obstruction or a vesicular ureteral reflux. And so I guess I'd be happy to take any questions maybe before I move to the next slide. Thank you very much, and thank you for this very, very uh, complete overview on the development of kidneys and the urinary tract. Um, we have a lot of attendees, so please uh, don't be shy and uh, ask questions. Maybe while other people are thinking, I can already start with a question. Um, so uh, when we see patients with uh, uh, kidney dysplasias or uh, different anomalies of um, uh, excretion system. Uh, in the majority of these patients, uh, we don't find really the genetic mutations. I think in the larger series, it's about 20-25% if you test really all known genes. Um, can you comment on that? Um, and also, I'm interested whether it's a common practice in the United States uh, to, to test for the genetic anomalies. Uh, maybe you can um, comment on the genetics a little more. Okay. So as far as the first question goes, I think that probably speaks to a variety of the environmental factors that may impact on kidney development. And so whether or not one has placental insufficiency, dietary reasons, I think there's also, um, if you test for gene products, that sort of doesn't necessarily include potentially epigenetic factors that may impact on kidney development. Or, um, so I agree that most of the children that we see do not have genetic mutations associated with their congenital urogenital anomalies. And I think it's partly environmental, partly sort of other factors we may not be testing for, like epigenetics. And then partly, um, but they're fairly complicated biological processes. And I don't know that we know all of the things that kind of um, impact how well the urotark bud branches. And it may not be um, related to genetic mutations all of the time, I would say. As far as um, the gen underlying genetics, at least right now in our practice in Pittsburgh, I would say that we don't um, genotype all of these kids. We do often genotype the kids if they have other anomalies. So if they have an isolated congenital anomaly of the kidney and urinary tract, we haven't been genotyping them. I suspect our practice might start evolving because um, you may be aware there was a recent um, paper that suggested that um, patients with chronic kidney disease, if you sequence them, that a significant proportion of them had um, a mutation that could be identified as being potentially pathogenic. That was not not just for congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. So we've kind of had a discussion with our own group as to whether or not we would expand that. But at present, um, usually we would genotype in the setting of somebody who has signs of a syndrome or other congenital anomalies outside of the urogenital tract. Okay, so the questions from the audience um, are starting to come. So we have um, the question from uh, Dr. Kumar. And the question is, are there any extra renal abnormalities that need to be ruled out with various renal abnormalities? So what is your practice and what do you advise? So we, so the most common anomalies or extra renal anomalies that we see are um, cardiac. Do we as a, we, well, I would say we perform an echocardiogram on most children, but if there's a completely reassuring cardiac exam, we don't always do that. Um, that would be the most common associated anomaly. If you had reasons to think that, you know, they also certainly um, can also be associated with vertebral anomalies, um, if there is any hearing defects. So, so if the more systems that are sort of um, affected, the more likely we would be to do sort of more broad screening, I would say. it For us, I think it's still dependent on their physical exam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think many of these uh, additional abnormalities like uh, cardiac anomalies would be already seen on the prenatal ultrasound, so some of them would be known. And if you have another anomaly, maybe you'll screen for some others, like the hearing loss or maybe some skeletal right. anomalies or something. Right. Okay. 
Um, so we have a question from Dr. Kleinman, who thanks you for a very nice talk. And um, <coughs> there is a small question uh, where the glomerular mesangian cells are coming from or developed from. So we think the glomerular mesangial cells are derived from the renal stroma, and the evidence for that comes from um, uh, lineage tracing studies done in mice in which you um, lineage trace using a transcription factor called FOXD1, which marks the cortical renal stroma. If you lineage trace from that, those cells seem to um, give rise to the glomerular mesangium. So you would anticipate that FOXD1 positive cells become glomerular mesangium. FOXD1 positive cells in the renal stroma come from intermediate mesonormin as part of the renal stromal population. Okay, so there is another um, uh, question. Um, do you recommend prenatal screening for renal anomalies? Uh, I think this question is coming um, from uh, Dr. Matuba. I, I think it would be nice if people type their name that they indicate their country because I think the practices can be very different around the globe. So what is uh, uh, the common practice in the United States for, for screening for the renal anomalies? So commonly uh, women here get an ultrasound at 18 weeks gestational age. So pretty much all pregnant women will get that. And, and that is when we would often pick up a, a congenital anomaly. Um, they may be screened more than that if there are other clinical reasons to do that but as a general screen it's usually around 18 weeks gestation mm -hmm. okay and then the second question is if you find uh, uh, prenatal renal anomalies what is your uh, postnatal approach so it depends on the prenatal anomaly and so the things that are more concerning for us typically would be so um, bilateral involvement so if there's evidence that both kidneys are involved if there's evidence for oligohydramnios, um, those sort of would be at higher risk for, for showing signs of renal insufficiency very early on. And so those kids are often identified to our practice early and we follow them sort of postnatally right away. In it, if it's a solitary kidney um, that otherwise looks normal, we would often see them in that as a follow-up in the outpatient clinic, but we, they wouldn't be as followed as closely as somebody in whom you'd be concerned about bilateral renal involvement. So it really kind of depends, I think, on the spectrum of the renal anomaly. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is another question from Dr. Pintos Morel. Um, he asks, uh, what is uh, the standard follow-up uh, for extreme premature babies huh? from the extreme preterm babies? So that's I guess thing. in terms of kidney function follow-up. The yeah, follow-up think... of, yeah, okay, please go on. Oh, okay. I think that's a really interesting question insofar as um, uh, extreme preterm infants, we think are probably at increased risk for poor nephron endowment because if you're born before 36 weeks gestation, clearly you haven't, con you haven't finished your forming your full nephron complement. Um, some of that formation we think occurs postnatally, it's not clear how well, if that's sort of comparable as, as if you were in utero. And so I think those kids do merit long-term follow-up. Um, and we've had some discussions as a practice about whether or not we would have them come to see us as a as a matter. Of course, we haven't done that yet, but I think there is a, there's a reasonable rationale to do so. Um, they're at higher risk for, uh, I think, chronic kidney disease, hypertension over the long term. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think uh, there is really a lot of evidence, I think, now to, 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 to have yeah. some standard follow-up uh, yeah. for this, uh, yeah. these babies. Yeah. And it, it just, we haven't uh, yet got a standard clinic, but I think that's something that we should probably be thinking about. So. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. We have another question from my colleague from Belgium, uh, Dr. Thierry Schumanns. He asks, um, what is their uh, embryologic explanation for posterior urethral valves? So it's still a little bit unclear. So it was thought to be a remnant of a, a membrane that forms during um, uh, genital ureteral development. Um, but there are some competing theories about that. And so it's not entirely clear that we know the exact cause for posterior urethral valves. The, I think most people think it's that um, an embryological remnant. Um, but there is some thought that there is an underlying 
developmental um, issue that impacts not only the valves but also formation of um, the nephrons at the same time because they often are associated with uh, renal dysplasia. It's not clear whether or not the dysplasia is just related to obstruction or also related to a common developmental event that happened at the same time as the valves and the and the um, formation of nephrons. So I think it, the last time I had a look at that question, I think there was still, I just can't remember the competing theory. So the one that I know of most commonly described is the embryological remnant, but there's at least one other one. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think these are the questions from the audience. Oh no, there is still one question coming uh, uh, about the embryology for prune belly syndrome. I think. <laughs> Another great question. <laughs> so, it's thought to be an underlying defect in smooth muscle differentiation, which gives rise to um, the the formation of the. Um, the abdominal wall cavity, but also impacts the smooth muscle differentiation in the bladder. I'm not sure I can tell you a whole lot more than that, unfortunately, but that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Maybe just as a last question, if there are no other ones, uh, 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 your topic, actually your research topic is on the role of the microRNAs in the uh, kidney development. Uh, do you have some uh, uh, interesting information, which is, I mean, I'm sure there is a, a lot of interesting information, uh, but are there some things for the clinician that you say this uh, microRNAs may be responsible for certain anomalies or low nephron number, something for the clinicians to take uh, with them in a very short, uh, I, I can imagine you cannot explain it in two words, but maybe there is some, you know, hot uh, uh, news that you can share with us. So um, one particular set of microRNAs that we're interested in is a cluster called MIR-1792. Um, and we're interested in it actually partly because it's been described associated with Feingold syndrome. And that was the initial description actually came out of, uh, I believe, Necker's Hospital in uh, France. And they described a group of children who have features of Feingold syndrome that are associated with MIR-1792 deletion. And so those children have developmental delay, short stature, um, some uh, skeletal anomalies in addition to um, a mutation in MIR-1792 and our data would suggest that children with um, deletion of MIR-1792 are probably at higher risk for renal hypoplasia so I guess you know if you see somebody who has Feingold syndrome you could think about MIR-1792 MIR in that context. Okay this is very and interesting so maybe it's a call patient. for the people who are listening if you have kids with this uh, a phenotype, maybe you can contact Dr. Hor for, uh, for <laughs> testing for this deletion. <laughs> and we have a very last question, and I think we will stop after that. Um, Dr. Yilmaz is asking whether uh, you know uh, any specific teratogen for the kidney. Specific teratogens? Yeah, for the kidney development. So I guess there are multiple teratogens that are known to affect kidney development. I don't know if the question is more directed at something that's specific to kidney and not anything else. Um, the common ones yeah. that we run into practice would be like uh, ACE inhibitors um, that pretty significantly can impact kidney development. So ACE inhibitors or um, angiotensin receptor blockers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these are the most common maybe in our, in, our, in, in our clinical practice, maybe at different parts of the world, there are different uh, toxic substances which are used, uh, but um, I'm not really aware about some very specific uh, teratogens for the kidney. I think uh, um, that we can, we can stop here. Maybe you can show the last slide announcing the, new, uh, the, the next webinars. Uh, so please, um, uh, register to the next uh, webinar. So it will be a very, very interesting lectures uh, already this week. Uh, the IFTA webinar on the best clinical practice by Rukshana Shroff on uh, uh, native vitamin D therapy in children with CKD. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we will continue with ERCNET advanced webinars on rare kidney disorders uh, till by the end of January. And uh, the next educational lecture will be uh, on February 11 on genetics of uh, kidney diseases and basic concepts and testing. 
So Jackie, I would like to thank you very much for the great lecture, the audience for being here with us and for asking very interesting questions. And I'm going to close the webinar. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.